In this video, we're going to look at uh, the inverse of the parabola. Two key concepts are to be explored under this concept. Number one, you have to be able to sketch it. Number two, you have to be able to place a restriction on the domain so that the function can actually qualify as a one-to-one -one function. If it is not one-to-one -one function, then it is going to fail the vertical line test and in the strictest sense, it's not regarded as a function. So, sketching it in and placing the restriction. The equation is not necessarily examinable. To get the equation is not necessarily examinable. So, the first example we're going to encounter is um, this one. The graph of m of x is given, uh, the equation of m of x is given as negative root of 27x. And this is valid for all values of x greater than 0. We are given a point which is 3 and minus 9. And it's said to lie on the graph of f. Use your graph to determine the values of x for which f of x is greater or equal to minus 9. So, the on, they want us to use the graph. If we're going to use the graph, then I'm going to do some interpolation. The point P is here, 3 and minus 9. They are saying, where is the graph of f of x? Greater or equal to minus 9? Greater or equal to minus 9? That means I'm going to interpolate from this point straight to the y-axis. Then I also interpolate straight to the x-axis. This is 3 and this is minus 9. Where is the function above minus 9 in terms of y values? It's above minus 9. They want the x values. Then this is going to happen from x less or equal to 3 but greater or equal to 0. How did I get that answer? By interpolation. How did I get that answer? By interpolation. So from the point I interpolated to the y-axis, that gave us minus 9. I also interpolate straight to the x-axis, that will give us 3. Then we answer the question. The question is saying, where is the function of f of x greater or equal to minus 9? Where is the function f of x greater or equal to minus 9? Greater means it's above, on top of. So where is this function on top of minus 9, the corresponding x values? This is only possible if we're taking the x values from 3 going straight to the left towards the origin. Hence, I'm saying from 3 up until 0. x less or equal to minus 3, but greater or equal to 0. This is us using the graph. If you're using the graph, you take an approach called interpolation. You take an approach called interpolation, where you literally move from one of the axes, in this case, the y-axis to the point, then from the point to the x-axis. And you are doing this perpendicularly. You are doing this perpendicularly. That means the line of interpolation has to be perpendicular to the y-axis, in other words, it is parallel to the x-axis, then the line of interpolation from the point to the x-axis has to be perpendicular to the x-axis or parallel to the y-axis. So, interpolation requires that you draw perpendicular lines to both axes coming to the point. I can also do it algebraically. How would I have done it algebraically? You would have said minus root of 27x greater or equal to minus 9. The first thing we need to do is get rid of the negatives. So it's either we're going to multiply or divide both sides by a negative. That will leave us with root 27x great less or equal to less or equal to 9. Why did the sign change? Because by the laws of inequalities, if you multiply or divide both sides by a negative, the sign has to change because you have literally changed the number line system. So, the number that is bigger becomes actually the number that was smaller thereafter. So, we now have root of 27x less or equal to 9. 
to remove the roots, laws of algebra say we square both sides. So we're going to square either side. When we square either side, we now have 27x less or equal to 81. Lastly, x was less or equal to 3. In the domain of the function, it was explicitly stated that x has to be greater or equal to 0. So, the, the domain in which the question is answered lies between x less or equal to 3 and x greater or equal to 0. There is a restriction of the domain to all the values greater than 0, but here in the solution we are seeing x being less than or equal to 3. So that means the domain is restricted to 0 to 3. Either way, this is how I solved it algebraically. Here I solved it graphically. The question obviously wanted us to solve it graphically. Okay, that was question 9.1. That was question 9.1. I am now going to proceed and do question 9.2. Question 9.2. Write down the equation of f to the minus 1. We say f to the minus 1 indicates that we are dealing with an inverse. So y was equals to root of negative uh, root of negative uh, negative root of 27x. To get an inverse, the steps don't change. Step number one, you interchange x and y. So that means wherever there's a y, you put x minus root of, wherever there is an x, you put y. That's step number one. Step number two, we say you do any algebraic manipulation that is going to make y the subject to the formula. So algebraically, here we first have to get rid of the negative. That means next step we have negative x is equals to root of 27y. Thereafter, algebraically, we have to remove that root there. How are we going to remove the root? By squaring either side. Square other side. This leaves us with 27y is equals to x squared. And the last step, the most obvious step, we wanted to find y. To answer the question, they said it should be in the form y is equals to. That is not the form they want there. We've got 27y. So we have to remove the 27 by division either side. That leaves us with y is equals to x squared divided by 27. This is the form in which they wanted it. Furthermore, they say indicate all restrictions. Indicate all restrictions. When you move from one function, the original function, to its inverse, the domain and the range change. So in the original function, the domain was stated to be x greater or equal to 0. Conversely, this can only be true if y was greater or equal to 0. That is the desired that is the desired restriction because they say it indicate all restrictions. Indicate all restrictions. Why? The corresponding function is going to be above the x-axis. That's number one. Number two, the corresponding x values are going to be less than or equal to zero. That answers question 9.2. So for the three marks, there are two marks for finding the equation. Then half a mark each for the restrictions. A restriction for the range and a restriction for the domain. Next up, it is only natural that they request that we sketch they're going to request that we sketch the function. Sketch the inverse of the function. Indicate the intercepts with the axis and the coordinates of one other point. Well, I am going to superimpose it. One thing about inverse is everything changes. The y becomes the x and the x becomes the y. So, p image is merely minus 9 and 3. p image, the image there would be on the inverse. And in this case, it's going to be minus 9 and 3. So, they're going to share the origin, but the function is going to be like this. 
the function is going to be like this and this is p image with minus 9 and 3. This is f to the minus 1. Did I answer the question? They wanted the intercepts. This is the intercept, the origin. So one of the intercepts is 0, 0. And the coordinates of one other point. The one other point is the the one other point is the image of P. And the image of P is minus 9 and 3. That satisfies that request there. Lastly, 9.4, describe the transformation of F to G if G is equals to positive root of 27. Positive root of 27. The key difference here is that the negative in front of the root has disappeared. So, if G is equals to, this is 9.4, 9.4. G is equals to positive root of 27x. Positive root of 27x, they have managed to remove the negative. That implies G of x is actually minus f of x. In this instance, the significance of this minus or this negative is a reflection. This is a reflection in the x-axis. So, to get the graph of G, we took the graph of F and reflected it in the x-axis. If that be the case, then the corresponding function, the corresponding function, just to add a sketch of it, would have been like that. And this point, which I'm going to call P double prime, because it's a different image to this one, this is G, it would have turned out to be 3. The x coordinate literally stays the same, but the y coordinate is now positive. The y coordinate is now positive. So we have taken the function and reflected it about the x axis to put it up above the x axis. There. They wanted me to describe for one mark, describe the transformation and the description. Of such a transformation is that it is the reflection in the x-axis. That concludes that question there. Just to recap what is important, you should be able to show that you can interchange as you move from the origin, original graph to its inverse, you should be able to interchange the values of x and y. That's what happened to this point P to its image on the inverse. If A it was 3 and minus 9, on the inverse, it will now be minus 9 and 3. You should also be able to sketch the graph. The given point or the image of the point gives you a guide as to how you sketch the graph. Not only that, there is also the issue of domain, range and restriction. If here in the original function they had stated that x had to be greater or equal to 0, this is in f, in f to the minus 1, then the range was going to be y greater or equal to 0. Conversely, as you can see, here it's taking negative values of y because it's under. That means its range was y less or equal to 0. Then the corresponding domain of this would be x less or equal to 0. So another appreciation that is required here is the change in x and y. The change in x and y as it pertains to the domain as well as the range. Then obviously you have to have an appreciation of transformations. The last point there, the last concept they are checking is whether you have an appreciation for transformations. In this case, the specific transformation was a reflection in the given axis which is the x-axis. That concludes that question. The next question we have is a composite function. A composite function involves a combination of two functions. One, an inverse parabola as well as a, an exponential function. So the graphs of f of x, f of x is stated to be 
negative root of x over 5. And this is valid for x greater or equal to 0. It's only valid for the positive end of the x-axis. Then we have the graph of g of x. The graph of g of x is stated to be log to the base of 5 of x. And they are shown below, there is a point T on the graph of F. So on the graph of F, there is a point T, which is 20 and minus 2. 20 and minus 2, there is the point T. A is the x-intercept of G. A is the x-intercept of G, hence it is on the x-axis. It is the point where the graph of G cuts the x-axis. And B is a point on F. B is... The point on F, simply because at A there is a line joining A and B perpendicular to that x-axis. That means A and B. That is the key. You see this when you analyze the question. That 90 degrees said uh, in, implies that the x-coordinate at A is exactly the same x-coordinate at B. So, since A, B is perpendicular to x-axis, a, B is perpendicular to X axis, therefore X coordinate at A is the same as X coordinate at B. They share the same X coordinate. We can determine the X coordinate at A because it's the x-intercept of the graph g. We can just say y is equal to 0. But we'll get, that, we'll get to that in a moment. Another way of saying exactly the same thing is to say a, b is parallel to the y-axis. That's another way of saying it. So a, b perpendicular to x-axis is as good as saying a, b is parallel to y-axis. This is true since x-axis and y-axis are perpendicular to each other. This is the initial analysis of the question. We are analyzing the wording as well as the diagram. You should always be able to relate the diagram to what they are saying there. And as you do that, most of the answers to the follow-up questions, you already have them. You first have to critically analyze the question. Once you do that, you easily start to answer some of the questions. Write down the range of g of x. Write down the range of g of x. g of x is a log function. So 6.1, 6.1, the range of g of x is such that y is an element of real numbers. Why is this so? This is so because there is no asymptote. For the log function, there is no asymptote horizontally. There is only a vertical asymptote. That asymptote pertains to the x values, but in terms of y values, there are no asymptotes there. Eh? So there is no horizontal asymptote. Hence, there are no y values that we need to exclude. There are no y asymptotes. In that case, we include all values of y from negative infinity up to positive infinity. The shorter way of writing the same thing is simply to say y is an element of new numbers. Some of you might choose to write it as y lies between neg uh, positive infinity and negative infinity. This is also acceptable. It's just a different notation, but nonetheless it's acceptable. Moving on, calculate the coordinates of A. What was special about A? Let's analyze. A is the x-intercept of G. X-intercept, that's an English phrase. Mathematically, what does that imply? X-intercept simply implies that Y is equal to 0. So 0, I will remove G, and in its place I'll put 0 is equal to log to the base of 5, X. And here you have to change from log uh, notation to exponential notation. So what do you do? This log is the base. It will raise the, to be raised to the exponent 0. And then we we'll have x. That means the corresponding value of x is just 1. Therefore, at a, its x-coordinate is 1. But we say that an x-intercept, y is 0. So the coordinates of a are 1 and 0.
Calculate the length of AB. Calculate the length of AB. This is where we made our deductions about AB. So we said AB has A and B share exactly the same X coordinate. That X coordinate is 1. That means by the time we converge on the function F, the corresponding X coordinate B is 1. So we need to figure out the corresponding Y coordinate. The Y coordinate, that means F of X is equals to negative root of X over 5. We know the x coordinate, this is y is equal to negative root of 1 over 5. All I really did was substitute x is equal to 1. So it's negative root of 1 over 5. Therefore, b, the point is 1 for x and negative root of 1 over 5. Those are the coordinates of b. Thereafter, what do I do? This implies the distance AB, since they have the same x coordinate, all you merely do is subtract the point on top A from the point below. And you are going to get, I'm using a functional approach. There is also an analytical approach where we use the distance formula. I'm going to do both. So AB is just going to be 0 minus minus 1 over root of 1 over 5. And the answer becomes root, positive root of 1 over 5. That is the distance AB. I used an analytical approach where you say the function on top minus the function below it. That is the first uh, approach. That is to question 6.3. I'm going to do an alternative approach where I use the distance formula. Since we know both coordinates of both points, so 6.3 alternative approach is to say AB is equal to root of A was 1 and 0. So it will be 1 minus 1 squared plus 0 minus minus 1 uh, root of 1 over 5 squared. AB is equal to 1 minus 1 is 0. So that's root of 0 minus minus. That's just positive root of 1 over 5 squared. What we do know is the square and the root cancel. We are left with square root of 1 over 5. Here I used analytical geometry using the distance formula to converge on exactly the same answer. Use of analytical geo to converge on exactly the same answer. Moving forward, it is given that H is obtained when g to the minus 1 is shifted 2 units to the left. Write down the equation of h. Shift. This is a horizontal transformation. So we first have to get the inverse of g. We first have to get the inverse of g. Inverse of g, y is equal to log to the base of 5x. Then x is equal to, this is 6.4. Uh, log to the base of 5y. Exponential notation, the 5 raises to the x, so 5 to the x is equals to y. Thereafter, this is g to the minus 1 is equals to 5 to the x. Fair enough. Now they say h of x is equals to g of x shifted 2 units to the left. So g to the minus 1 x plus 2 units. 2 units left ones. So, h of x is going to be 5 to the exponent x plus 2. They gave 3 marks. How are the 3 marks allocated? You first had to get 2 marks for getting the inverse, then another mark for applying the transformation. 
they shifted the graph, they take the inverse of g and they move it two units to the left. So, wherever there's x, it becomes x plus 2. Lastly, they say determine the values of x for which f to the negative 1, which is the inverse, is less than 20. Is less than 20. There are two approaches of doing this. Earlier on, we did a graphical approach and we can do an algebraic approach. So, I am going to do both of them. We're going to employ two, both approaches to be able to solve the problem. So I just need the graph so I can do interpolation. I'm going to draw the graph for the sake of the graphical approach. All I need is the graph of f, no need for the graph of g. There is a point t which is 20 and minus 2. Determine the value of values of uh, x for which the inverse, the inverse of this graph, as you can see, it's going this direction. This point is 20. So t prime or t image is going to be minus 2 and 20. I'm going to sketch this in blue. I'm going to sketch this in blue. Its inverse is going to be here on that side. It is coming along the line y is equal to x. It's reflected along that x. And that point, t prime, becomes negative 2 for x and 20 for y. Then what do they want from me? They are saying, where is this graph f to the minus 1? Below the point of 20. Now let's start to interpolate. If you interpolate here, parallel to the x-axis, perpendicular to the y-axis, you're going to hit 20 there. If you interpolate from this point straight to the x-axis, parallel to the y-axis, perpendicular to the x-axis, you are going to hit minus 2, or converge on the point minus 2. The same way is this function below 20. The corresponding x values are from minus 2 to 0. Therefore, to answer question 6.5, the corresponding x values are ranging from negative 2 to 0. That is the graphical approach where you use interpolation. What if we had done it algebraically? Could it have been done algebraically? Do it. So what do we have? F to the minus 1. We first had to get F to the minus 1. So F is equal to negative root of X over 5. Thereafter, Y is equal to negative root of X over 5. I merely replaced F with Y. Then you interchange X and Y. That means X is now equal to negative root of uh, negative root of y over 5. Use any algebraic approach to be able to get y as the subject. So you square both sides. First, before you square both sides, divide both sides by the negative. So negative x is equal to root of y over 5. To remove the root, square both sides. Square either side. This is going to be x squared is equals to y over 5. So y ends up being 5x squared. Therefore, f to the minus 1 is equals to 5x squared. f to the minus 1 is equal to 5x squared. And if we have f and f to the minus 1, its domain was such that x had to be strictly greater than or equal to 0 then the corresponding range had to be y strictly greater than 0. And as you can see, its range there for f had to be strictly less than 0 or strictly negative. 
That means the corresponding domain of the inverse set to be strictly less than zero. That is important because we are about to decide. We're going to get two answers. We're going to disqualify one answer. So from there, now let's answer the question. The question was, where is f to the minus 1, the inverse less than 20? This is the inverse. So 5x squared less than 20. First thing you do is divide either side by 5. x squared is now less than 4. We're trying to solve for x. So how do we do that? We take roots both sides. x has to be, x has to be less than minus 2 or x has to be uh, less than 2. This is a quadratic inequality. So I could have moved straight from there and said x squared minus 4. I draw the number line. I'm going to put two critical values, minus 2 and 2. This is the quadratic inequality. However, let's keep in mind, for f to the minus 1, the inverse is domain which is in terms of x is strictly less than 0. So, this point, 0, is the cutoff. We're not going to take any positive values. Therefore, this would imply that our value is from minus 2 up until 0, which is exactly what we had. Here it was strictly less than. Same approach. We did a graphical approach and an algebraic approach. And in any case, we converged on the same answer. So always ensure that you've got two, at least two approaches, graphical as well as algebraic. The last question we want to do is also a composite function. It's called a parabolic function h and a logarithmic function g. We are given the graph of g of x is equals to log to base a of x. We are also given a function h of x is equals to negative x minus 3 squared minus 1. a is the point of, uh, a is the x-intercept of g and p is the turning point of h. The two graphs intersect at p. You analyze this. This is a parabolic function that is in the turning point format. It's in the turning point format. So its turning point is going to be 3 and minus 1. Is that plausible? Yes, it is possible. Here where the graph is turning, it's on the positive side of x. So its x-coordinate is going to be 3. It's also under the x-axis. So its y-coordinate is going to be negative 1. This implies p is 3 and minus 1, the turning point. So on the function of g, we now have a point which we can use to substitute y is equals to log to base a of x. I'm going to substitute, this is the x, this is the y. I'm going to input those values here to be able to solve for a. So minus 1 is equals to log to the base of a, which is unknown of 3. Convert that log exp uh, expression into a, an exponential expression. This is a to the minus 1 is just equal to 3. Laws of logarithms, 1 over a is equal to 3. Cross multiplication, you're going to get a is equal to 1 third. That answers the first question. Question 3.1 when we wanted the value of a. a is just about one third. Write down the coordinates of p. By deduction or analysis, we were able to already get the value of p from the turning point format of the parabola. Now we want to get the coordinates of a. They say a is the x-intercept of g. a is the x-intercept. 
x-intercept implies that y is equal to 0 at that point. So y is equal to log to the base of one third of x. But we are saying at x-intercept, y becomes 0. 0 is equal to log to the base of one third of x. Exponential form, one third to the zero should correspond to x. x is equals to one. Therefore, a is one and zero. p is three and minus one. Answers the second question. Write down the equation of g to the minus one. They want us to find the inverse of the exponential function, which is sort of the log function there. So 3.3. .3 y is equals to log to the base of one third of x. Step number one of getting the inverse is where there is y, change to an x. Where there is x, change to a y. Why do we do that? Because this is the basis of an inverse, a reflection in the line y is equals to x. If we're using the, y, the line y is equals to x, that means we can interchange y for x and x for y. This one third to the exponent x is equal to y. So I'll call this g to the minus one is equal to one third to the x as required. Determine the possible restriction. Determine the possible restrictions that could be placed on h to ensure that h to the minus 1 is a function. If they say possible restrictions, it's because it's going to fail the vertical line test. It would fail the vertical line test. So how do we do that? Here's how. So I need to sketch the graph. Here's the parabola turning at p. This is the function h. And its turning point is 3 and minus 1. That is the axis by which it is reflected. It is going to be reflected in the line y is equal to x. But an inverse simply means you interchange. If we're at a point P, which is 3, 1, then the image of that point P becomes minus 1 and 3. The image of that point becomes minus 1 for x and 3 for y. Minus 1 for x and 3 for y. Minus 1 is somewhere here. And 3 is there. The 2 meet here. And the function. This is h to the minus 1. This is h to the minus 1. This will be where the two meet, it's like that. If I were to draw a vertical line through that function, it was going to fail because the vertical line is going to cut it twice. The vertical line is going to cut it twice. This is exactly what makes it to fail the vertical line test. So how do we restrict? We restrict the domain of the original. So that one of the two legs of the parabola is not permitted in the inverse. So the restriction is going to be either x less than 3 or x greater than 3. One of those. Doesn't matter which one you take. In any, in any case, the answer will be correct. Either you take the left side leg which is x less than 3, and in that case, we'll just have the top side in the inverse. If you take this, let me color code them. Let me color code them. If I color code them, maybe it will ensure that you see better. So the right side is color coded purple, and the left side are color coded blue. Then I'll show you in this inverse which one corresponds to which. So, they meet at the point minus 1 and 3. The purple side, contrary to what you might think, it's 
actually the bottom side of the function and the left side is actually the top side of that inverse. So it's either you take the blue side only, if you take the blue side only, you're going to get that function only as the inverse. If you take the purple side only, then you're going to get that purple side as the inverse. And in either case, whether blue or purple, it is still going to pass the vertical line test. Lastly, determine the values of x for which g dot h is less than 0. This is a product. If it is a product in this instance, then you say less than 0, it's because one of those is positive while the other is simultaneously negative. So one function will be positive. By positive, I mean above the x-axis, while simultaneously at the same time or at the same x value, the other function will be under the x-axis. The other function will be under the x-axis. I'm going to superimpose the log function that we had today. And this point was 1 and 0. So we want an instance where one function is above the x-axis while the other is under the x-axis. The function h is strictly under the x-axis. Its range is y less than 0, strictly less than 0. So we look for where the graph of g is going to be above the x-axis. So here are the scenarios. If I have g dot h, then I say less than 0. The scenarios that we're going to contemplate is either g is plus or h is negative. Or g is negative while h is plus. However, here's something to note. G, sorry, h is strictly less than 0. Therefore, we can never have a scenario where h is positive. So we disqualify that scenario. We disqualify it. So we're looking where g is positive above the x-axis while simultaneously h is under. So g above x-axis g has to be above the x-axis while h at the same time is below x-axis when does this happen? it happens from the point A going leftwards so that means we are dealing with x line between 1 and 0. That is the solution to it. x line between 1 and 0.